Hello. Today we'll be looking at uh, a fourth uh, general broad uh, system of ethics uh, for the course. Again, we've seen utilitarianism, we've seen some non-consequentialist moral theories, uh, Kant's in particular, we've seen some uh, moral pluralist uh, theories of ethics, and so we're going to talk about the, the last of those, uh, the last of the systems of ethics we're going to take a look at, is uh, called virtue ethics. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, virtue ethics is uh, actually much older as a theory of ethics uh, or as a system of ethics than some of our modern theories. Um, keeping in, keep in mind, uh, the word modern in philosophy means, um, you know, post roughly 1500, right? So, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very old, it's, a, it's an old discipline. Uh, so in general, modern theories of ethics tend to uh, see the major question of ethics as a question of what should I do? Right? Utilitarianism certainly is focused that way. Which action has the best overall consequences? Uh, Kant is very concerned about uh, uh, making yeah, about action types, what types of actions are right or wrong, and what features of those types make them right or wrong. Uh, uh, pluralists themselves are just saying, okay, when, when you do a thing, you have a duty, right? The duty is to do a thing or to not do a thing. Um, and again, so the question is, what should I do and what shouldn't I do, right? Those are um, that's a very characteristically modern approach to the field of ethics. There's nothing wrong with it necessarily, it's just not the only possible approach. Ethicists in the ancient world, uh, particularly the Greco-Roman world, uh, were very much more interested in the question, how should I be, rather than what should I do? They, they believe that the question of ethics is a, a different one. Virtue ethics has seen something of, uh, of a resurgence in uh, recent years. Uh, uh, late in, in, in about the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, people have paying, been paying a lot more attention uh, to virtue ethics than they had for some time prior. Uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, and the number of, of philosophers are, and, and the philosophers who've been uh, sort of interested in virtue ethics and have started to re-explore uh, some of its fundamental ideas. Um, one of the first of these uh, is uh, uh, G.E.M. Anscombe. It's uh, Gertrude Elizabeth Margaret Anscombe. Uh, she generally went by Elizabeth. Uh, she was uh, actually a very, very famous student of uh, uh, the famous, at least to philosophers, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein um, uh, in, uh, uh, when he was in, uh, in England for most of his career. Uh, and and uh, her, her work, Modern Moral Philosophy in 1950, it's often credited with beginning this resurgence in interest um, in virtue ethics. And of course, that, uh, that resurgence has continued. Um, uh, Philippa Foote wrote a, very, a major work uh, called Virtues and Vices in 1978 that's uh, served as uh, a major landmark of uh, virtue ethics. Uh, in, in fact, you might recognize Philippa Foote's name. She was also the person who formulated uh, the, the original trolley problem, uh, which uh, uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson talked about in the uh, article that opened this course. Uh, Rosalind Hursthouse has uh, has written a, a, a great many uh, really excellent uh, pieces of, of, about ethics, um, uh, specifically from the perspective of virtue ethics. Uh, one in particular is her article on virtue theory and abortion, it was, uh, published in 1991, uh, and it's one of the most anthologized works of ethics. It's hard to find any uh, sort of collection of, of, of ethical writings that doesn't have uh, that article in it. And I think for a long time, it was certainly the best known and, and one of the very few uh, uh, places where virtue ethicists had, had uh, really dabbled in applied ethics and said, look, here's how you use virtue ethics to say something about specific ethical topics and issues. Um, and it's a really, really excellent article. I'd, I'd recommend it to anybody. Uh, in addition, uh, Julia Annis, uh, throughout the through the 90s and and uh, and, and uh, to the current day, uh, has produced many quality writings about virtue ethics. Um, uh, too many to sort of you know name in, in, in a succinct way. Uh, and of course, Martha Nussbaum is a, another, uh, is perhaps the most prominent Aristotelian ethicist who's alive. Um, and that's important because uh, Aristotle is sort of the beginning of virtue ethics. Aristotle gives us our first method for how to actually use and systematize virtue ethics. And we'll talk very much about Aristotle's account uh, once we have some of the basic groundwork laid uh, and, and an understanding of what virtue ethics is um, in general, right? Uh, Nussbaum also uh, is uh, uh, very recently written uh, this book here uh, called uh, Creating Capabilities. 
Um, and this is a, a very important book for global justice. And if you read it, you can see how informed it is uh, by the some of the ideas of virtue ethics. Uh, it's a very, very important book. And, and it's, it's not one that you have to have a PhD in philosophy to read. It's uh, very readable. It's it's directed toward just, you know, the, the, the general public. Um, uh, and I think, again, I think it's going to be one of the more important books of, of the last hundred years, um, if I'm going to, if I'd stake my uh, stake my reputation on that and stick my neck out. Um, I, I, it's a it's a marvelous book. I think it'll have a lot of influence. Uh, so again, I'd, I'd recommend that to anybody. All right. So now, uh, what's a virtue? <laughs> okay, uh, that's a, the first step toward understanding the basic idea of virtue ethics. Uh, starts with a virtue. What is it? Okay. And uh, we want to talk about both virtues and vices, the, the, their opposites, right? A virtue is a good character trait, okay? That's, that's the most easy way to define a virtue. A vice is a bad character trait, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, so this is, we're going to play the dictionary game here. Right, what's a character trait? Well, a character trait in this case is a stable disposition to act in a certain way in certain circumstances, Right. So imagine, uh, say, honesty, for example, as a character trait. Right. Uh, we think that would be a virtue. That would be a good character trait to have as opposed to, you know, dishonesty. Right. Um, but the idea is that does uh, the honest person, a person with the character trait of honesty, do they always tell the truth and nothing but the truth in every possible circumstance? Well, not necessarily. But to say that. Uh, but you can't call somebody honest who isn't very honest, right? It can't really be part of their character unless they really do have a stable disposition to be honest uh, uh, in, in most cases, right? And, you know, uh, and of course, there are going to be some exceptions. And, and we'll talk about some of those exceptions to behavior and how they fit into virtue ethics. But in general, like a character trait is, again, this, this sort of, it, it's a part of a character. It, it really does describe who a person is. It, it, it describes the way that they are and the way that they're likely to act in certain circumstances. Right? And so when we focus on, on what sort of stable parts of our personalities there are and how those things operate, then we're really thinking like virtue ethicists rather than thinking in every given case, what do I do in this case, right? Uh, it's a very different approach. So one of the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm following fairly closely here, uh, Russ Schaefer Landau's outlining of virtue ethics in the textbook, which is uh, what a, the reading that accompanies this lecture. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit of it out of order because I, I think it's important to get this part uh, out pretty early. Um, so uh, you, you see there's this uh, term here. It's a, it's a Greek term, and like many Greek terms, it looks hard to pronounce. It's not too bad. It's, it, it's pronounced eudaimonia. Uh, once you give it like the English transliteration, uh, you see uh, this, uh, this uh, bit uh, over here that is the, um, that's, uh, that's the Greek alphabet, right? That's the, the Greek way to spell it. Um, and in case you don't, again, if you don't read any Greek, here's the English transliteration. So you so substitute some English letters for Greek letters, uh, and you get a pretty good approximation. Uh, the term eudaimonia is 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 often translated as happiness, and I'll complain about this later when we talk about the Aristotle reading. Uh, but I'm also going to complain a little bit about it now. Again, this this idea of, of happiness uh, as, as being what eudaimonia means, it's I think a bad translation. Um, and I think a lot of other people think it's a bad translation. Uh, a much better translation is something like well-being. Um, Schaefer Landau suggests the term flourishing. I think that works just as well. Um, because the idea is that happiness, when, when you say happy happiness in modern in, to a modern English speaker, you're not thinking of a kind of overall comprehensive, like living well. That's not generally how we use the term happiness. We tend to use the term happiness to refer to the feeling of, of to, to mean something more like a feeling of pleasure than like a state of being or something like that. That's, uh, it's, the eudaimonia is very much a state of being and not a feeling that anybody has at any particular time. You can feel happy, but you can't feel eudaimonia. You Eudaimonia refers to the ultimate state of a life and whether it is a life well lived, right? That's that's much much closer to what's going on there. And so a core part of virtue ethics, certainly all of the virtue ethics that descends from Aristotle, is this idea that the virtuous life, that is the the, the life of the virtuous person, 
right? A person with, you know, who's cultivated the virtues lives a better life than one who has not, right? It, it is a better life for them. Um, and in fact, it's, it's the best of all possible lives to live this life of virtue and reflection, right? Many of our other moral traditions have something of a, a, a trouble in, in the sense that they don't very well connect this sense of uh, prudence with morality. Uh, what I mean by that is this, right? The utilitarian says, look, it's important to create the greatest total amount of pleasure. Whether that means the most pleasure for you or not really isn't important, okay? And, you know, that's part of the impartiality of, of uh, utilitarianism, and, and that comes out well, and, you know, there's some good, there's some good points to that. But in a sense, it doesn't necessarily give somebody, you know, sort of a, 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 an ultimate reason uh, to pursue, right, the best overall consequences, uh, because, of course, it may not benefit them at all. And, you know, um, the utilitarian says, well, then, you know, sometimes, look, it's just true that sometimes being moral doesn't benefit you. Well, the virtue ethicist isn't going to say that. The, virtu the virtue ethicist is going to say that ultimately being virtuous is living the better life, right? Uh, the two are synonymous. Uh, of course, Kant himself uh, never thought that morality would make your life any better. Uh, he just thought you were obligated to do it anyway. And so again, some of our previous uh, theories have, have not necessarily connected the good life with the moral life, uh, but virtue ethics absolutely does. That's a very core part of it. Is that they, 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 they're, there's this claim that, again, the best life for a person is the life of virtue. Right, that's going to be a key claim that virtue ethicists will make. And we'll explain that, right? There, we'll, we'll get an argument for that uh, from Aristotle once we uh, see Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics. All right, so one of the things that people tend to like about uh, virtue ethics uh, is, is that it acknowledges moral complexity, okay? Uh, so one thing to know about virtue ethics uh, going in is that it is a pluralist system of ethics, okay? So just like, uh, you know, the, the ethics favored by Ross or, or by Michael Gill, um, virtue ethics is also a pluralist system of ethics. And it's pluralist because it does not think that there is sort of one overriding virtue, right? There's not only one virtue you can uh, reduce everything to. And there's no real rule for ranking the virtues either, right? There, there are just, there are many virtues and they're all important, <laughs> right? And sometimes developing one may come at the cost of developing another, um, et cetera. I mean, that, that's entirely possible. And so uh, some of the same issues you have with uh, moral pluralism, you also will have uh, with virtue ethics due to the, the fact that it, that it is also a pluralist system of ethics, right? Uh, there is, I'm going to tell you, there is a method, right, for distinguishing virtues from vices. It's not like just anything goes, oh, this is complicated, you know, do whatever you want. Uh, absolutely not. Um, and again, we'll talk about that method uh, when we talk about Aristotle's account here, because it's Aristotle that really provides the sketch of, of the first uh, real reliable method for determining, right, what, uh, the, what, are, what things are virtuous and what things are uh, vicious, right? And further, one of the other things that people tend to like about virtue ethics as a as a as a system is that it uh, it gives moral experience a, a kind of uh, the role that that on reflection perhaps it ought to have, right? Uh, so, for example, one one way that uh, partially the way that Schaefer Landau talks about this is is to talk about sort of child prodigies, right? There are child prodigies in some fields. Okay, so there are musical prodigies, right? You know, kids who can you know play instruments from very very early ages with you know uh, with high degrees of skill. Uh, there are mathematical prodigies, right? You know, um, uh, people, you know, kids who young, very young people who really sort of understand a lot about uh, mathematics almost intuitively, right? There are uh, prodigies in chess. In fact, if you're if you're not a grandmaster by the time you're you know like 17, <laughs> uh, you're probably not ever going to be a serious contender for the world championship. I mean, that's kind of kind of the way that is these days. Um, and, uh, you know, so there are, of course, some non-prodigies who do play at a very high level, but, um, but yeah, most of the, the very best players were, were also prodigies. Um, and, you know, because again, chess is a rule-based system and it's a perfect information game. And, you know, once you know the rules, that's it. That's, that's all, that's all there is. Um, music and mathematics are also fairly rule-bound, uh, activities, right? So, but of course, there are some other places where you, there really aren't any child prodigies, right? Uh, for example, you know, comedy. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, some kids are kind of funny, right? But not often not on purpose, right? They often don't understand why what they're doing is funny, and that's what's funny about it, you know. Uh, or uh, maybe you know, like you, you could say, like kids say the darndest things, right? But 
But again, most of the time they don't know why what they're saying is funny. They couldn't explain it if they if they tried. Like not in, not in well not in at least twenty or thirty years generally. Uh, and uh, you know if you listen to you know a lot of kids can't even tell jokes properly. Like a lot of the jokes that are popular among very young people, they're really not that funny, right? Um, uh, because again, they, they, you have to develop a sense of humor over time, and uh, you have to sort of you have to get the humor, right? There's a lot of life experience that goes into like getting a joke or even being able to tell one or even you know to tell why it's funny, even though generally speaking it's obnoxious to explain why a joke is funny. So. Uh, uh, there are no prodigies in business management, right? I mean, there are relatively young people, like, you know, people in their, oh, 20s or 30s who, who manage to make successful businesses, but not not people in their, you know, early teens that, you know, make like giant successful businesses, manage large groups of people, right? Again, they, they might do well for a 12 or 13 year old, even exceptionally well, um, but they're not, this, you're not going to hire this person as a CEO and say, yes, manage lots of adult people. It's just not going to happen, right? Because again, we think that such a person just doesn't have enough of the relevant experience um, to really be, to, 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 to really have a fair shot at doing the job well. Um, uh, same thing you want to say with morality. I mean, if you're going to consult, if you have a really difficult moral decision to make, do you consult a, a, an eight-year-old or an 80-year-old? Okay. I mean, of course, cases will differ, right? You know, and uh, individuals, you know, uh, uh, vary. But boy, in general, uh, you, you want to say that there's something about life experience that is irreplaceable, necessary, and absolutely relevant to moral wisdom. Um, and so uh, certainly the way that virtue ethics is set up, it, it, it's, a, it's a system that really does reward that kind of moral experience, Re really say that there's something valuable about that that you really can't get in any other way, right? That, you know, the virtues to some extent have to be developed over time uh, and, and, and have to have a lot of life experience, right? And so uh, since virtue ethicists focus so much on character traits, uh, the, the development process for character traits is, is an important thing for them as well, because character traits have to be developed and then adapted over time in response to all of this life experience and very careful reflection. We'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. Uh, but finally, uh, one of the other, one of the last things that, that people tend to really enjoy about virtue ethics is the way that it sort of interfaces with the whole person. It's a very holistic theory of ethics. Um, so, for example, in 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 Kant's uh, uh, moral theory, emotions have absolutely no role whatsoever, right? Uh, uh, morality is is a, a product of pure reason, right? Uh, and it's best left in in isolation from anybody's particular inclinations. For example, doing the right thing just because you like doing it that doesn't have any moral worth for Kant. Remember, it's doing the right thing only because you recognize it as the right thing that has any moral value. And of course, um, there's no there's no real role for emotions to be played in in utilitarianism either. Certainly not in making utilitarian decisions. You want to say, okay, which action do I have that gets the best overall consequences in terms of pleasures and pains, and I have to do that, right? And again, uh, it seems like it leaves out a, a lot other than sort of calculation, right? And that's um, well, that may be that that can be a little off putting. So virtue ethicists uh, tend to incorporate, uh, you know, sort of, you know, the whole person into into morality, uh, and including uh, the role of emotions. Emotions play a couple of important roles in this kind of a moral theory. For example, emotions can tip us off to what's important, right? They're sort of rough guides uh, to eudaimonia, to this good life, right? Um, uh, but of course, they're not to be used without without judgment. So one analogy to this I can think of is, you know, look, there's a reason why things with a lot of like fat and, and you know, sugar taste good to us. It's because our bodies do need calories. But of course, if we're in an environment where we have plenty of calories, well, we sometimes have to use our judgment and sort of back off of some things, even though they taste good, right? So in general, we, we have to pay attention to what sort of feels good, what is pleasing to us, right? Our friendships are very pleasing to us. Right. And so it's sort of natural that we should, you know, use that as, as a kind of guide. Say, well, there's something good about friendship then. Right. Something to be pursued there. But of course, we have to use judgment. We can't go overboard. Right. We can't, uh, you know, be so devoted to our friends that we sort of, um, you know, lose focus on other things that may also be important. Right. 
Uh, emotions also play a kind of motivational role in moral life, right? So if you think of, of uh, 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 various emotional states like, like empathy, right? If you see somebody who's in a very bad situation and you think, my goodness, I can imagine being in just exactly that situation and that feeling of empathy give, uh, may, may be part of the reason, right? Part of the, the explanation for your helping them. Well, look, I mean, ultimately that's good. Your emotions did, did something good in that sense. And so one of the things that virtue ethicists are, all, are going to be very much about is reflecting on what our emotions are doing, what they're telling us, uh, and what kind of motivations they supply to us, and then using our judgment to, to, to adapt our emotions, right? Uh, the idea is we want to feel pleasure in the kinds of things that really are good for us and good for others. Um, and uh, that again, that takes that takes work, that takes habituation, it takes training. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's a very holistic uh, moral approach. And so one of, uh, another of these sort of key elements of, of virtue ethics then is this idea of moral education and training, right? Uh, so uh, this is a paraphrasing from, from Aristotle, but, uh, but Aristotle had the idea that nobody is virtuous by nature. That is, virtue doesn't develop just all by itself, right? You don't just leave somebody alone in a room for 40 years and then go in there and say, hey, look, they're virtue. Prob uh, definitely not, okay? Um, so uh, again, virtue doesn't just happen but it's also not contrary to nature either, right? It's not something where you have to fight your, your, all of your natural tendencies in order to be moral. Uh, rather, you have to use with good judgment some of the natural tendencies we have uh, and then and, and, and sort of you know, shape them uh, you know, intentionally, you know, carefully. Uh, uh, and, and of course, that's part of the reason why teaching the young is so important um, for, uh, for Aristotle, certainly, and uh, I think for virtue ethicists in general. The idea is that you have to, you have, to have a kind of process, right? Um, uh, and that you know, moral understanding, right? This eudaimonia, you get this, the life of virtue, right? Is, uh, is the result of a kind of lifelong process of, of learning and training. Right, you know, learning, uh, learning how to adapt your desires, learning how to adapt uh, your various emotional content, learning how to change your character in, in some ways and others. Um, those are all uh, really important uh, characteristics of virtue ethics. And we'll talk again specifically uh, when, when, we hit, when we hit Aristotle about some of the ways uh, that that manifests itself. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to mention here is, uh, and, and sort of bring in that Schaefer Landau interestingly doesn't, uh, and perhaps I could see why, is a, a fairly famous account from a, a psychologist named Lawrence Kohlberg um, in the you know early to mid 20th century came up came up with this. Uh, what he called them was these six stages of moral development. Uh, and these six stages are split into sort of three levels um, if you know, whatever, you know. Uh, and the idea is that he, he was trying to describe the moral development of, of people generally, right? Again, his process here is descriptive. He's not really saying anything about how people ought to be, although I think there are some clear assumptions built in about how people ought to be, right? There's a sense in which uh, the later stages, right, uh, the higher level stages are better, right, than the earlier level stages. Uh, except that, you know, uh, again, there are certain times where it might be appropriate to be at one of these lower levels, uh, especially, say, for example, when one is very young. Um, but, uh, but in any case, again, keep in mind, this is intended to be a kind of description of, of uh, where people find themselves, right? You know, it's not necessarily, this isn't necessarily a, a theory of ethics. It's, it's, a, it's a study of how people sort of view ethics at, at various different uh, stages of their lives. But I feel like it's important because it reflects uh, something that that you're you're going to hear something very similar from virtue ethicists in the sense of um, how moral education uh, is supposed to happen, right? I think you know that there's some similarity here. Uh, so, for example, in um, in the Schaefer Landau text, uh, okay, actually going to find it here. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, so yeah, this is uh, the example he gives on the end of page 261 and into 262. Um, he says, uh, uh, think first about how apprentices in other areas are trained. 
An apprentice in a professional kitchen begins with a list of do's and don'ts, a set of hard and fast rules. Over time, she learns the limits of those rules, when to honor them and when to break them. There is no master rule book that can give her this knowledge. She acquires it through trial and error, through the advice of experts, and through a deeper understanding of cooking methods and of her ingredients. By the end of a successful education, she is something of an artist. The same holds true of moral education. We begin as apprentices following an unquestioning way the rules handed down by our parents and teachers. In the early stages of moral training, children learn simple rules and are told to treat them as absolute, never lie, never steal, never hit others, and so on. These rules are crude, but it's right to ask our children to obey them. We have to address our learners where they are. As children mature, they will, through experience and guidance, come to appreciate when exceptions are called for. We gradually step back from the rules we learned on our mother's knee and subject them to careful scrutiny. A successful education will provide an independent thinker, one who doesn't need the old over simple rules as a crutch to get through each new situation. We understand, for, ex for instance, that honesty is the best policy, but sometimes honesty would be so hurtful and gain so little that evasion is the right way to go. As a rule, friends deserve our loyalty, but that doesn't mean we must cover up for them if they steal for their employer and ask us to lie about it. This line of thought supports the virtue ethicist's rejection of a simple moral litmus test, a formula that could be used by anyone, no matter her degree of moral sophistication. Such a test not only overlooks the great complexity of morality, but also ignores the point that people possess moral wisdom in degrees. Advice that is suitable for a novice will be too crude for an expert, and vice versa. Right, so I wanted to give a little bit more uh, flesh to that example because I think I think it's very very good and it, it's a, it's a, a very good statement uh, of what the virtue ethicist has in mind here, and so I think uh, Kohlberg can can provide something of of a sketch of that again as long as we don't use this without uh, some exercising some judgment. And so as he describes it, he describes this level one what he calls this pre-conventional or pre-moral stage. Okay, uh, and again, this is the stage of many children, and of course, some never do progress beyond this stage in terms of moral development. And so, level one, right, is is a, what he calls sort of punishment and obedience, right? Uh, right and wrong is determined by whether there or not there's a punishment. Uh, orders are obeyed when a punishment is feared. Power and authority are deferred to. So, notice. If you're only doing something to get a reward or only to do avoiding something to, to, to avoid a punishment, right? If that's the only reason you're acting, you don't really understand anything about morality. You might be obeying some of its dictates, but you're but not because you understand them, right? And so that's that's why this is so low on the totem pole. Certainly, you have to do this at some point, you have to learn how to obey moral rules. Uh, but if you you know, if that's all you if that's all you ever do, then you're 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 stuck at level one here. This is not uh, this is this is not a, a very this is not a sophisticated view of morality. Okay, and a little bit above that is the level of instrumental exchange. Okay, so those at this stage believe in sort of do unto others as they do unto you, right? Uh, one seeks to fill their own needs and desires as and only gives to others if it ultimately benefits himself. Okay, and so this is one of those things that's okay. Well, I'll be nice because it gets me good things, right? Not because maybe there's like an official reward or an official punishment, because it sort of generally makes things better for me. Okay, uh, and again, uh, some people never do uh, progress beyond that, uh, but but that's a very simplistic way of thinking about morality, right? It's like, oh well, morality is a thing that we all do so that we can help ourselves, right? Well, not so much. And that's why you'll recognize sort of the golden rule in here and you think, why is that so low? It's like, well, because, uh, I mean, Chair Fernando addresses this much earlier in the text. The golden rule essentially is, it, it's a rule that reduces morality to people's desires, to what people desire. And that's, it's it, it, it's an okay um, uh, yardstick for at least some things, but it's not a very sophisticated moral rule. And so uh, in the ultimate uh, uh, stages here, it is fairly low on the list, right? Um, it's... Uh, Again, it makes morality depend on people's desires, and, so, and, and that's, that's at level two there, this uh, level of instrumental exchange. Uh, level two is what Kohlberg calls 
a uh, the conventional stage, right? They're a stage of conventional morality, right? And 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 he, he points out that this is the stage that most people peak, right? He says not everybody actually. He thinks he thinks actually very few people end up getting to levels five or six, um, and he thinks most people are somewhere in level three or four, uh, even as adults. Uh, so level three is a sort of interpersonal or tribal conformity. Okay, and the idea is that right and wrong is determined by what is accepted and popular in the group, and that group's value expectations. It's focused on manipulating happy relation, or sorry, ma maintaining happy relationships with others, uh, and uh, betraying the group's norms and expectations is 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 what is wrong, right? So the idea is that uh, you've learned to behave more or less as the people around you behave, right? And again, that's what I like to call a, a moral autopilot, right? And and many people do get there. I mean, I think most adults get at least to this level where they, through through some level of instinct or automaticity, end up behaving more or less as those around them are behaving, right? They don't do uh, what you don't do, and they do what you're expected to do, right? And that's, uh, again, that's not bad, certainly, but it doesn't reflect a very sophisticated understanding of why things should be done or or what's really the nature of the good, right? It's not it's not very reflective. Again, it's kind of, you know, moral autopilot. You could do worse, but you could also do a lot better. And then, of course, there's the sort of law and order or societal conformity. So it's not only uh, behaving as the people around you behave, but behaving in, in something uh, of, of a, a more extended way, right? Sort of recognizing obligations beyond your immediate surroundings and immediate community, right? And again, I think many people have no real trouble getting, getting this far. Uh, you know, again, most adults, right? And these individuals are motivated by uh, the desire to maintain order and safety in society by following rules, right? A person respects laws and authority figures and sees value in institutional order, right? Keeping consistency for their own sake, right? And so uh, Kohlberg himself writes about what's uh, called uh, sort of a cynical phase of this, uh, where people in this stage uh, tend to see morality in terms of, you know, um, you know, why should I believe in anything? Because uh, they have yet to realize that there are universal ethical principles. Um, and I, I don't really want to say a whole lot about that because I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure how universal that really is. Uh, but the idea is that we, if, if you, the difference between this phase, phase four and phase one, uh, which is, you know, just sort of reward and punishment, is that you tend to see these rules as good in and of themselves, right? You follow the rules not just to avoid a punishment, but you follow the rule because you recognize some inherent goodness in the rule. Right, and that's um, uh, that's the idea, right? Uh, but usually that goodness is in terms of like stability or you know um, uh, uh, the functioning of society or something like that. The third and final uh, level uh, that Kohlberg discusses is what he calls post-conventional morality, right? And, and again, he thinks that rather few people actually reach this uh, stage of moral development. And so at level five, what you have are what he calls the sort of prior rights and social contract, where uh, you, you see a kind of commitment to sort of ideas of fairness and, and justice and things like that. Um, the idea that laws should reflect the protection of moral principles and of human rights, uh, that people have a commitment to uh, procedural justice that is doing things in a fair way, justice and outcomes, you know, that, that you know, making sure that people have what they deserve and, and don't get what they don't deserve. Uh, so a, a, a great concern with justice is sort of a hallmark of, of like, you know, level five here. Um, and then finally, he talked about you know universal ethical principles, and this is really the level at which uh, we're trying to discuss things really in an ethics course. We're trying to boil morality down uh, to its most abstract level to try and say like, a, what what is it that makes something right or wrong? Um, what 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 is it that makes anything valuable? What's the nature of the good life? What are the important questions? How do we uh, gain some some ground on on these important questions? That's a sort of thing that you do at level six. Um, uh, you know, where, where, you know, people have, you know, beliefs that every person has inherent moral worth, um, that, you know, there's an abstract moral principle that's not determined by authority or written law or something like that. Um, and again, persons at stage six tend to believe themselves bound by universal moral principles and believe that morality is an end in itself, right? They tend to sort of, uh, in, in Kierkegaard's words, uh, take the categories of moral, of right and wrong seriously, okay? Um. And again, that's uh, not everybody thinks of, of morality in that way, right? Thinks that, no, 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 there's an actual sort of, you know, there's a moral fact here and there's something that makes it a moral fact and, and we're trying to figure out what that is, right? That's um, uh, certainly stage six thinking. Now, again, 
whether Kohlberg is correct about about this uh, or whether you can really very neatly divide these kinds of things up, uh, I think the broad outline of what Kohlberg suggests is plausible, right? That there are different stages of moral development, that not everybody progresses to the top stage of that development in their lifetime, and that uh, the sort of advice, for example, that you might give a master chef uh, is going to have to be pretty sophisticated advice compared to that that you're going to give a novice cook, right? And I think uh, moral advice is going to be kind of in the same boat. The sort of moral advice that you could give to somebody who's, you know, really, you know, quite advanced in, in, in their moral development is going to have to be pretty uh, uh, pretty nuanced uh, as opposed to the kind of moral advice you're going to give somebody who's just starting out on that path. And the point is that, again, uh, uh, moral education and training are a big, big part uh, of the story of virtue ethics and, and how it works. Right? And so this picture that we've just painted of moral development uh, mirrors the idea in virtue ethics that virtues have to be taught and they have to be learned, they have to be developed and refined uh, and sort of habituated. That is, you, you make them into habits, right? You make the habits of doing the right things uh, and that's what gives you, right, you know, character traits. You have to gain them by habits. Uh, and you do that through a whole lifetime of careful reflection and, and uh, sustained effort, right? So, uh, the, the, those then are the uh, fundamental uh, elements of virtue ethics. So what you want to move on to next, you want to go ahead and, and read very carefully and take a look at the, the lecture on um, on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, because what Aristotle is going to give you is he's going to give you an argument for why the, the best life is the virtuous life, the life of virtue, um, and and also how to tell the difference between virtues and vices, uh, and then what to do in order to develop and uh, and, and, and refine uh, those virtues in your own character. <laughs>